am just delighted to welcome you to chapter six of Prophet. Prophet the hat maker's son. And if you look on your screen, next to me sitting is Douglas Gillies. And Douglas Gillies is the author of Prophet the Hat Maker's Son. Mm -hmm. And you know, today we're going to have Diane Ruth. She is going to be talking about what her relationship was with Robert from age 11 until she's now in her later years, I won't say because that's her business, but I do want you to know that each of you are so precious and so precious to Robert. So I'm going to start today a little bit different. I'm going to start with one of our guests, Brian Berman. Brian Berman is one of the special people on our planet. He met Robert at the University for Peace when the University for Peace was quite young. He was not the only one in the audience. The Dalai Lama was there too. So Brian, why don't you start today? And I'm going to put you on um, speaker view so we can get all the full benefit of the sculpture behind you. All right. Would you all mute yourself, please? And then we're going straight to Brian. I'm, I'm going to tell a seminar for an okay. hour and a half. Douglas, mute yourself, a please. a lot of people. Okay, let's see if I can. I'll just mute him myself. All right, my friends. Um, Brian Berman? Thank you, Barbara, and thank you all. I don't know if you um, can all see who's on my shirt here. Uh, Barbara, do you want to make me the focus speaker? Yeah, you want, speak? uh, you're on speaker view. I am. On speaker okay. view, and I see two faces there on your shirt. Yes, I have Mahatma and Martin, and if 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 I had. Robert's picture, I would put him on the on this pin as well. So I'm going to go back to 1989. Um, 1989, there was a World Peace and Sustainable Development Conference in Costa Rica sponsored by the United Nations and the Costa Rican government. And one of the keynote speakers was Robert Mueller. And Robert talked about the new cosmology in education. And he gave the most inspiring view on how, how every aspect of education needed to have a unitive common principle, that it wasn't just math or science. Can you hear me again? Thank you. Okay. So what I was saying was that Robert spoke about the new cosmology and all aspects of education. It was a vision that I hadn't heard anything to that degree of what would benefit our children and the world. And so um, even though I was there with the Dalai Lama and 700 other visionaries. Robert's voice and his message brought me to a, just a, a, a great understanding of the possibilities, how one person can make a difference. If one person can, as Bucky Fuller said, be a trim tab that can push the direction of our culture into a united way. And Robert had that capacity in his, the strength of his voice and, and his vision. And so I'm honored to be here today to just say a few words. And on a personal note, um, <clears throat> I was part of the facilitation delegation for that conference with an organization called Global Family. And one of, the, one of the fellow facilitators was Dr. Nina Meyerhoff. And 33 years later, I meet Dr. Nina Meyerhoff again in a Unity Earth Zoom session. After 33 years, we reconnect and Nina invites Lisa and I to work 
for the One Humanity Institute in Auschwitz in Poland, in the House of Hope. And so the arc of time is in each moment, how would I have ever imagined 33 years later, I would meet Nina Meyerhoff again and how central she is to the vision of one humanity. Um, so Barbara, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. Um, Tell us why you met her and why, where you're going to go next. Yes, so in, before we went to Costa Rica, Nina Meyerhoff and I were part of the delegation of uh, Global Family, and we were first in Moscow. That was for my 40th birthday, and uh, <clears throat> Nina and I celebrated my birthday together. And then we went to Kiev, and in Kiev, we were creating Barbara Marks Hubbard's resonating core process. We were teaching people spiritual groups with meditation, being, being with each other to support each person's evolutionary journey. And then we went to Leningrad and did the same thing. From there, we flew back to the United States and then to Costa Rica to help facilitate the conference. And so now 33 years later, and uh, next month, Lisa and I pack up our belongings and we uh, fly to Poland. Amazing. To you know, it took a lot of courage and a lot of trust for you to do this. You've been in um, Ojai for 10 years with this fantastic art that you have created. It's your grounding. It's your, you've created international cities of peace. And as I look at you, Brian, I see a radiant expectation that you're going to do something even bigger. And I see that. So tell us, are you ready to go? <laughs> oh, my God. I, I have never been in as much stress as, <laughs> as I am. We have to be out of the house by September 30th. September 30th. That's not many days from now. And I still have about 60 sculptures here to find homes for. And uh, besides everything else. So we have, we're celebrating Peace Day on Sunday, uh, September 18th. We have a full day program and uh, it's going to involve a lot of children. And we're, we're excited. That will be our farewell to Ojai. And yes, we've been here 11 years and um in 2014, Lisa and I and a few others founded Ojai as an international city of peace. And one last thing. Tell me about the sculpture behind you. This is the magic. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a sculpture that I refer to as oneness. It's, it's my holos design. And you, you can see all of the cells. I mean, it might look like snakeskin but we're all part of the totality. So it's an inseparable oneness. And, and the design of Holos really, when, when I created it, and I'm wearing a, a pendant of it, um, when I created it, I said, this is a symbol for our one humanity. That was 2013, before I knew anything about uh, Nina Meyerhoff's One Humanity Institute. I mean, you know, all I can say is there's a screenwriter that has that has a script for each of us. All right. I have one question for you today, and that's from Jerry. Make it short, Jerry. We want to move on. All right, Jerry. She's muted. She should be. Yeah, unmute you. yourself. Okay, I'm Jerry. First of all. I would like to applaud your extraordinary courage. And the second thing is um, one of the episodes that will follow the, the launch is on the Cities of Peace. And, it, and it, uh, Fred has already made a beautiful video. I'd like to invite you to tell your story then to a worldwide audience uh, from Poland and join us again that will be sometime very late in the fall or early in the new year. 
and okay. I'll be in touch with you. And I am absolutely Jerry is away. visioneers, and that's why Brian is on because he's a visioneer. And I'm going to move right on, Jerry. I think your message is clear. And thank you. We'll be you. set. We'll be you. probably be more settled by then. All right, I'm going to go back to gallery view so I can see all of you. Okay, Turn blessings in. to you all. Bless you perfect. and thank you so much. So as you can see, Robert did not stay home. I was talking to one of my members of my United Nations Association. She said something to me very interesting. She's very religious. And she said, Jesus didn't sit home on Zoom. He went out and met the crowds. Robert went out and met the crowds. He didn't just stay home on Zoom. Now, I'm not saying Zoom is bad. I'm just saying, get up out of your comfort zones and move. Talk to people. Let them see you. Anyway, with that, I'm going to go straight to our speaker tonight, and that is this afternoon, I should say, this morning, because Diane Ruth, I never would have met her if I would not have been involved with Robert. Because he had... In 1994, as you all know, we fell in love at this invitational created by another fantastic person in my life, Douglas Gillies, the author of Prophet, who is right next to me on your screen. And the invitational, Robert was invited to, it was to invite world leaders to come to La Casa de Maria for healing. And you've heard this story before, but it was Robert's reply when we sent him the letter inviting him to be at the La Casa Invitational. And he replied, with enthusiasm, I will attend. And when I read those words, I thought, who is this man? He didn't write about how great he was, that he was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. He didn't write that he started the University for Peace in Costa Rica. He just said, I will bring my enthusiasm and enjoy the meeting, and I will be there with you. Well, that really inspired me because people have said I have enthusiasm. I remember making a speech at a world business program and somebody said, your enthusiasm could sell anything. And I said, well, if I believe in something, I get inspired and I just can't help it. It bubbles out of me. So anyway, Robert meets Diane in Peru because she had not met him before, but she had been his fan since she was 11 because she was one of those girls who was in school and she'll tell you the story. And it was her aunt that said, there's one of us at the UN. There's somebody who believes in a vision and spirituality. Diane, all of a sudden, and I'm going to let her tell the rest of the story. So may I introduce Diane to you? <clears throat> if it wouldn't have been for the speech that Robert made in La Jolla, actually up on the mountain, the university that Joan Croc started, he was speaking and Diane and her mother were sitting in the audience. Diane had just come back from Peru and I got to meet this beautiful woman and her mother. The necklace I wear today, it's kind of like my signature necklace, was her mother's. Her mother always wore this necklace. And when she passed, Diane gave it to me. And I felt like I carry her spirit and her mother's spirit in this necklace because it's the harmony of all the pieces. And I think that's what we are. Today, we're in harmony. So I thank you, Diane. Tell us a little bit about your experience with Robert and why you felt he inspired you? Well, first, I've, I've got to say that um, Barbara and I got in a long conversation as we normally do a few weeks ago. And I was saying, wouldn't it be nice when we all get together once a month if people shared their experience and how, how Robert touched their lives? And so she said, great idea, you can start. <laughs> I didn't intend to start, but I wanted everyone to be included because we're all here because of Robert. And He's touched us in many different ways uniquely. And for me, um, as a little girl at 11, um, I think I was going through the blues or something, you know, because the bullies were picking on me and everything. But I was on a spiritual path since I was three years old through my aunt and mother. <clears throat> so that was always what saved me. So my aunt um, gave me something. It was a Lucius Trust. I said, I want you to read this. And I said, there's a man called Robert Mueller, and he was speaking to the General Assembly. So I read it and I, and I, it's like right away, just reading his speech changed the way I felt dramatically. And I was the one that said to June, I said, oh my God, June, we've got one in the United Nations. We've got an angel. We've got a spiritual being lifting humanity from the United Nations. So I was so excited. So anyway, through the years, I just quietly followed his career. He was always my secret spiritual hero. And then um, in the 90s, when I was interning as a psychologist at a domestic violence center, and totally involved in that. My aunt 
calls again. And she says, oh, by the way, I know Robert Mueller is your little secret spiritual hero. And he says, well, you know something? He's going to be a keynote speaker in Cusco, Peru next week. <laughs> and he says, a peace conference. Why don't you think about going? Of course, right. But how am I going to do that? I'm in the middle of this and I'm in the middle of that. And I don't have the money. And, you know, and I didn't think I could go. So then when I, you know, that night, I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm going to go. And so I called her back and I says, thank you again <laughs> for doing these special things. So, of course, the next day I told, you know, the internship, I'm leaving. I'm not sure when I'm coming back. And, um, you know, got a plane ride. So I get to Peru the next morning. Uh, we're all meeting in a coffee shop, you know, before we fly out to Cusco. Well, there's no seats. And there's a man with his back to me and I touched him on the shoulder. Do you mind if I join you? I really could use a cup of coffee. Sure. So I sat down and I go, you know, you're the reason I'm here. And it was Robert. And we got in the most unbelievable um, soaring conversation, very global on everything on the planet. We just went, <laughs> And, um, and the whole coffee shop was empty. And they said, you know, the plane's going to leave without you. It's time to go. And of course, when we got there, you know, his first speech that he did was just so moving. You know, not, I'm not only for me, the whole room. I mean, there was hundreds of people there. Not that everyone's there to connect with Robert, not just me. And I just felt blessed to be there. And, um, and so I met so many people there. I met secretaries and bookkeepers that saved up to be at this conference to spend a week with with Robert. Uh-oh, I think I lost no, it's you. It's just somebody's on their phone and they need to mute it. Keep going, Diane, you're fine. You're anyway, so um, I just thought, I'm just gonna be like them, one of the people there. And uh, I just saw the way he moved. He was just, he was just like the most amazing human being I'd ever, ever so inspirational. So anyway, it came time, if anyone's been to Cusco, there's this rickety train that you take that's hours long, like five hours to go to Machu Picchu. And we're all in line, herded in. You know, we don't know where we're going to sit. And of course, I end up sitting with him. <laughs> and, and we got another deep conversation. We had hours to explore problems on the planet, you know, and brainstorm about solutions. And so I could talk for hours about that six hours. So anyway, it was like thrilling for me, of course, to be on that trip. And many wonderful things happened that would take too long to describe them. But it was certainly one of the great moments of my life. So when I got back to San Diego and um, I found out he was going to be speaking at the Joan Crock um, University. And that's where I met Barbara. So I said, Mother, I says, let's go hear Robert. And I went up and introduced you know, my, my mother to Robert and he introduced me to you. And that was the beginning of a lifelong friendship with Barbara and Robert. We became so close. I flew back and forth from San Diego to Santa Barbara, probably countless times, especially every time he would speak. And uh, it just, he was just one of the great blessings of my life. And, you know, to me, he was a gift to the planet that we've all appreciated, you know. And so for, for me, I just thought, you know, we all have been touched in different ways by Robert. But I do feel he was one of the great souls on the planet, you know, that touched us all. And I just thought we all need to at least honor our own experience with him. And luckily, he gave a great friend, Barbara, too, to me. And we've been great friends ever since. And I'd like to open this up because we've got so many special people in this group. And we're all here because of Robert. And I'm sure he's here, too. And I think everyone can say a few words of how you met, how he touched your lives, how he inspired you. One last thing, though, before I pass the mic back to, to Barbara is I remember him telling me early on about um, Dr. Cooey and to do this every morning, it was every day in every way, you know, and I've expanded it and I do, I never miss a morning without doing it. You know, I've used that in my life. And uh, so that was another gift he gave, many gifts, many, many gifts, many inspirations. And he's definitely still my hero. Barbara? Thank you. Um... Dr. Kuwait has always been part of my relationship with Robert and with you too, Diane, because mm -hmm. in the book, chapter six, that was her job is to tell us why chapter six meant so much to her. Yes. It's about Dr. Kuwait saying every day, <laughs> every way I'm getting better and better. And you know, Diane would always write me a note and say, Barbara, can you send me some more of those? Most of all, they taught me <laughs> happiness books because in this book, you know, we maybe have the influence of Robert, but Robert got the influence of all these people from Secretary General Uthant to Aunt Mart 
to you name it. So Diana would say to me, I need to send this book to somebody. They need some inspiration. Now, this book is no longer in print, but it's on Amazon on secondhand books. And I just got this one from Amazon from a dealer called um, discoverbooks.com. And, and thrift- it's, it's still available. Diane? It's also on thriftbooks.com. Oh, thriftbooks.com. Get two copies. If they have three copies, get three copies. You will start sending it to the people who need it. I've had secretary generals write us notes. In fact, it was Ban Ki-moon who said, I keep this on my bed stand next to my bed. When I get discouraged, I open it up and I read something. And these are simple stories. In fact, his first wife, Margarita, is in here because he writes about honoring others. And in Chile, they think women don't become beautiful until they're 40. And he writes about how Margarita and he were married for a long time. She died of Alzheimer's. But it was the Chilean men who made the women feel beautiful and put them on a pedestal and created this harmony with women. And the fact that as you turn 40, sometimes we get a little depressed, but not in Chile, that's when they start to honor you even more. So that's in here. You're going to get more stories that, of how Robert meant something to you. And I'm going to in, stop for just a second, and I'm going to go to Bettina Gray. Bettina Gray is one of my very early podcasts. I couldn't stop talking to Bettina Gray because at, at the time she started telling me the stories of, I'm not even going to say what I know. I'm going to let Bettina Gray tell you what it is that made her feel so powerful. Okay, Bettina Gray from San Francisco. I'm not quite sure what you want to hear from me. I have a lot of things to say. So let's define it a more. What, what is it you want to? <laughs> I want to have an impact an impression of what Robert meant to you. Why did you pick him to be on your podcast? In those days, it was called the video. Why did you pick him to be on your video? Well, a little background. Uh, In 1993, after 100 years, there was a revival of the idea of a parliament of religions. There had been one in 1893, believe it or not, and Vivekananda came to the U.S. for the first time. The U.S. had an opportunity to hear from people of different faiths in 1893 at the Chicago uh, World's Fair. Um, Fast forward, people decided to do a a sort of revival of that idea in, in 1993, which began the World Parliament of Religions. And I had been doing interfaith work at that time for a couple of decades, and also had been involved in media as an interview host for PBS. Um, And it occurred to me, hey, all these people in one spot must make a very interesting, (coughs) excuse me, (laughs) just choked, (laughs) excuse me. (coughs) You know how you inhale? (laughs) <laughs> Oddly. <laughs> I've done that. So, <clears throat> uh, I went looking for who would be attending the parliament <clears throat> and was given a list of options. <clears throat> among the, name of the book, Sala, while you're coughing, Sala asked for the name of the book. It's called Most of All, They Taught Me Happiness. And that's the name of the book. And Bettina, um, if you need to get a drink of water, don't worry. We'll find somebody to fill in, but then we'll hear the rest of you. Actually, I'm fine now. Okay. So among the list was of suggestions was Robert Mueller. And I was fascinated by a government leader. I thought of the UN in political and governmental terms who would talk about spirituality. And so he was top of the list of people. We included interviews with the Dalai Lama and um, John Templeton for his award for science and religion and Swami Chidananda, the elder, sort of considered a Mother Teresa of Hinduism. It was an amazing opportunity that I got to sit down with profile interviews of spiritual teachers and leaders at that time in 1993 and asked them 
what resources they used to continue in their leadership. And what I got out of Robert was the word that comes to mind is yes. He said yes. He was full of ideas and he didn't say no to them. He explored them and his energy to say yes to even some of the most surprising of ideas, like a university for peace, which we still need. Um, that's what impressed me most. And the one story that stuck in my mind from many he told was of being in the French Resistance, being captured two stories from that. One being captured and put in a cell with only standing room, shoulder to shoulder, packed in a cell. And I know what any of us would have felt with that experience. And what he did, he said, was he pulled out, he found a stub of a pencil in his pocket, so he pulled it out and started writing a love poem on the wall. And to me, how many of us in the circumstances of being incarcerated by the Gestapo, I assume that's what it was, in, in a prison uh, under threatening, even terrifying circumstances with nothing, no, just shoulder standing room, would pull out a stub of a pencil and start writing a love poem. That is, Robert was, yes, embodied. Um, the other story was of him uh, at his office during the war, and the uh, police, I assume again, Gestapo, I don't know, German military, were looking for him went into his office and were asking for Robert Mueller. And he came down, smiled, greeted them with calm, and said, oh, he went that way. Smiled at them and continued walking on out of the office, completely misdirecting them with confidence and um, security. And I can only assume that inner strength was a spiritual strength to refuse fear and say yes. What a beautiful testimony. The power of yes. If you're going to say yes, say it with enthusiasm. That's what comes to me. And he said, yeah, and I remember him telling me that story. Thank you so much, Bettina. In the next issue of the Peace Podcast Magazine, we are featuring Bettina. And we even have the little, you'll have a little barcode where you can listen to her interview with Robert. Thank you. Actually, God. it's also available. Uh, the original one is available on Creative Films Media YouTube. If creative, you, what's the second word? Creative films. Creative films. I have a YouTube channel called Creative Films Media. And if you look up my name, Bettina Gray and Robert Mueller together on a YouTube search, it'll pull up five minute clips from those interviews. It is amazing what we can do on YouTube. I thank YouTube for my with my all my heart. It was Joyce Wyckoff, the editor of this Peace Podcast magazine, that searched and found it and put it together into a fabulous article about Robert. Joyce, why don't you go next? Give us a couple minutes of what Robert meant to you. This is Joyce Wyckoff, my partner, my editor, my best friend in Santa Barbara. God bless you, Joyce. Okay, look at that. There's Joyce. Are you on speaker? Okay. Now I am. Okay, Joyce. <laughs> Great to see I you. I want to tell everybody that that's uh, the the video that Bettina just described is exactly the one that will be in the magazine, so that you can find that if you got get it lost. But I'll also try to drop that in the chat before we leave today because. It was a surprise to me to find it because I wasn't familiar with Bettina's 
experience. And then all of a sudden I found that and it was just, wow, that's just great. It's a great video. And I didn't get a chance to know Robert anywhere near as well as most of you. But because I knew Barbara, she told me about him. Um, I was doing a series of international conferences on innovation and we were meeting in Santa Barbara and I just invited him to come speak to us. And it was a, it was a meeting of business people. So it was sort of surprising, like you said, Bettina, to, it was not the normal speaker for a conference like that. And because it was not the normal speaker for that group, he was amazing. And his speech was very uh, heartwarming. And then of course he played the harmonica at the end of the meeting. It was just beautiful. And people walked away with something that they wouldn't, that group wouldn't probably come across in their normal day-to-day life. So, it really impacted the whole direction of the, that was our second conference, I believe here in Santa Barbara, second of 14 altogether, and sort of just affected the entire trajectory of that piece of my life. So thank you. Thank you, Joyce. And you know, you talk about coincidences, you talk about people having the opportunity to invite another to in create a moment, and she did, I remember that. I was there and I watched the audience change. They went from thinking to feeling and it was incredible. Um, thank you, Joyce. And I have the honor of working with Joyce day in and day out. We're only a phone call away and we're only two miles away now. So I'm delighted. I'm gonna invite um, Joni. Joni, would you talk a little bit about Eamon Madison? Avon and Joni and Joni and Robert were pals and they worked together. And if it wouldn't have been for Joni, I wouldn't have been involved with the Peace World Peace Pro Peace Conference in 2016. Um, Rudy Westervelt called up Joni and said, Joni, um, tell me a little bit about who can help me put this conference together on peace. And she said, well, there's only one woman I'd recommend, and that's Barbara. And now we started the Rotary E-Club of World Peace. We've had the second World Peace Conference. And all of a sudden, we're working, and you see David Wick there. David Wick was clapping because he was Avon Madison's best friend. Now, Joni and David, I'm going to put you both on, and you just tell us all about what Robert meant to you. Okay, Joni. Well, Avon was, uh, Robert was the, the uh, patron saint of Pathways to Peace. That's what Avon called him because he was her inspiration for the International Day of Peace and for um, creating Pathways to Peace as it has been for these 40 years. And um, they were dear, dear friends. And so when I went to a conference in Santa Barbara, and met Robert. I was thrilled because I knew so much about him. And uh, we became friends and have been ever since. And he was, um, until he passed, and he was uh, the inspiration for the Action Coalition for Go Global Change with Dr. Lucille Green and Lola Kristoff. And he was the inspiration for the United People's Assembly at the UN and so many other things. And he worked very closely with Avon in creating the soul of Pathways to Peace and inspiring us for many years. And when I visited him and Barbara in, in Costa Rica, they inspired me and my soon-to-be husband to uh, get together. So they both have had an extraordinary uh, role in my life, and uh, it's all through Avon, who was a dear, dear friend of Robert's for many years, and he uh, welcomed us at the UN, and on we go. David. Well, I, I would just say yes, yes, yes to everything that you said, and, and Robert, um, I, I've known of Robert, uh, I've known of him, uh, through Avon before I ever met him. And just knowing of the the presence, the spiritual presence, and it is the, the positive moving forward um, attitude that really infused 
pathways piece. I worked with, you know, Avon and then Joni from the very beginning. And um, a couple of things just really come to mind as we're talking about him. And I'm also greatly appreciating uh, the prophet, prophet reading the book to really learn a whole lot more about the, his journey that formed him. And um, uh, it is very inspiring. I just find that it's just like, yeah, we've got work to do and we continue on in that, in that spirit. Um, but two things come to mind was in 1995, the uh, World Children's Peace uh, Festival that Pathways put together with many others in um, the headlands of near San Francisco. Um, and Robert was there. And uh, I was there with my very young son at the time. And he stopped and we talked and he just looked at him, my son, Cameron, just very closely and then really spoke to his heart and, and about you know, the goodness in people and what that means and then played his harmonica. And it just was, it was one of those um, inspirational moments that, you know, went deep um, into both of us. And so that was one of them. The other is that um, I have a booklet, I don't have it with me at this very moment, with Robert <clears throat> meeting um, San Darshan Singh, who's a spiritual master at the United Nations. And it's a book where they were, were together and really deeply honoring the, the depth of the spiritual, uh, spiritual consciousness, which is essential to world peace, to... Um, uh, all that we do, whether it's acknowledged or not, it's there and it's essential. So that was another part. He just continued to shine the light of, of goodness, consciousness, and uh, well-being for all people. So I'm very grateful for our paths. And I met with Barbara and Robert in San Francisco or in the early days. And so I'm, I'm grateful to be expanding my learning and knowledge of Robert. Thank you. Thank you. You know, David Wick and I are good friends because of the Rotary E Club of World Peace, and he has moved us beyond our wildest expectations. If you only knew what this man has done for peace and for the awards that we have given out in the name of peace. And I want to move now to Douglas Gillies. Douglas Gillies is one of those special men on the planet. Now, you think about La Casa de Maria, where I had the privilege of falling in love with Robert. This probably wouldn't have happened if Douglas Gillies wouldn't have helped me put together the Invitational. I served on the board of La Casa for 25 years. And then I said to the board, wait a minute, where do world leaders go to heal? You know, we have this fabulous retreat center for everyday people like you and me, but what about world leaders? And so Douglas was in this meeting um, and Don George, the director at La Casa said to Douglas, well, Douglas, if we were to have a meeting for world leaders, what would you call it? And Douglas, you finish that story. It's your turn and you may unmute yourself, dear. Unmute, unmute me. I'll try to unmute you if you have any trouble, participants. Douglas Gillies. Okay, you're, I'm, I'm gonna unmute you, I hope. Asked to unmute. You ha can you unmute yourself, Douglas, down in the corner? It's asking me to have you unmute. Was okay. It's start again. Do it again. One more time. It was yeah. my fault. Okay. Douglas yeah. Gillies, the author of Prophet and my dear friend. Well, thank you, Barbara. Pleasure. And Robert Mueller was a tremendous influence on my life. He was at the Lucasa Invitational. And one of the ideas we were coming up with ideas for what could go forward. And, um, and somebody suggested that we would come up with ideas for a better world. And Robert walked up and said, I'll do it. Now the idea was that we would all work on it, but Robert just said, I'll do it. And that's how he got working on his uh, many, many, many ideas for world peace. So um, that was the beginning. That's when I actually got to see Robert and know him because he just assumed responsibility for that amazing act. So I went to see him in Costa Rica and decided that I would write his biography because his life had been so interesting. And so I made several trips to Costa Rica to interview him. 
and took the, um, the, uh, the tapes and transcribed them and then worked for two years to whittle them down into what turned out to be Prophet, the Habmaker's son. And it was just so much, uh, so much joy to work with Robert and to explore his ideas. He never, for one moment, steered away from his positivity, for his op- from his optimism for the planet. He was a 100% of his character. And so wherever we would go in our conversations, I always learned something. And fortunately, I recorded them all so I could capture all of those ideas and put them into a, a book. And uh, Robert was one of the great gifts of my life. I'm very grateful that I got to spend so much time with him, both in Costa Rica and in Santa Barbara. Thank you, Douglas. Um, You know, you're not alone with that idea that you can have ideas that will really stay with you because Robert always loved it when you two were talking and you two would share and it would build a bigger bigger idea. When you talked with him, he would have an idea and you'd have an idea and it would build a bigger idea. In his book, Most of All, They Taught Me Happiness, Norman Cousins wrote the foreword to the book and he ends the book with, ends it with, civilians, civilization rather, gets its basic energy from its resources, but it also gets it from its hopes. And Robert Mueller was a prophet of hope, as Robert, as Douglas has said before. The tragedy of life is not death, but what we let die inside us while we live. And so I'm going to end that little conversation with Dorman Cousins, because he said, we need not fear the consequences of openings our heart, our homes, and even our nations. It is a privilege to be able to introduce an open man. And that was Robert Mueller. He definitely was an open man. And it is a privilege to say he opened himself fully to his readers in these pages that follow and in all of his speeches. He always played his harmonica because we know, and Bettina can attest to this, how music opens the heart. When your heart is open, you're in the mindfulness position, as Jim Halderman, a member of our group today, said. It's the mindfulness. It's the mindfulness of the body. It's the mindfulness of the beautiful understanding that we're more than our mind. I don't know who I was talking to on the phone, but somebody said, you know what we do? We waste our most precious resource. And as I was talking to them, I said, what is that most precious resource? It might even been Jim. I can't remember who said it our minds. We stay in the jail of our minds. We criticize ourselves. We start to say, oh, I did that so terrible. I'm a whore. Well, anyway, the resource is free. Don't waste it. That's what this person said to me. Whoever you are, thank you for telling me don't waste your mind. That's the most precious free resource we have on our planet. Now, I'm going to open this up and ask who would like to say something next. Douglas, I thank you for your moment. Desmond, did you want to say a word? Or um, Jerry, please. And I'm going to ask Sanford Hinden to say something, and then we'll close for the day. All right. Oh, all right. Douglas, I'm thanking you again. And Desmond and Jerry. Well, uh, thank you all for, for telling this wonderful story. Robert is a hero of humanity. There are not many extraordinary people who... Uh, who are heroes and heroines of humanity. We just decided here that we're going to include his playing of the harmonica on our event called Waging Peace, which is Robert's legacy. We met at the conference of It's a Matter of Life and Death. I can't imagine anyone whose heart impressed me more. And as a psychologist, I'm feeling energy of people all the time. And his was beyond beyond anything. We invited him to Vancouver to speak to the children. And and you can't imagine how uh, children would pay attention to a 75-year-old person. But I tell you that they were so fascinated that, that, that you can't imagine. And so uh, I, think, I think it's up to us to make Robert's legacy live. And the conference is called Waging Peace, which means being as active and intentional in waging peace as people are in waging war. 
And thinking about Robert, he used the word enthusiasm. The thing, the word I think about when I think about Robert is different. I think of his incredible courage to be in a place like the United Nations, which can so easily shatter your enthusiasm and your spirit. And here he was saying yes. That's the most powerful thing of all. So I would like to invite you all to attend this conference virtually. It's free on October the 9th. And, and you will see some of the examples of Robert's legacy. And it will follow with 10 episodes of the most incredible thought leaders in the world. And Robert is included. And we're so looking you, forward to it, Jerry. And we're going to move on to another speaker. Thank you for that. Can I, can I just say that I put of the Of course, link, Desmond. I put the link for the um, event that Jerry's talking about at the top of the chat. You're great. Uh, thank you. Both of you, thank you for your dedication and the work that you're doing for Visioneers. Laurie Marshall, please. Um, I wanted to say that I um, knew Ava Madison and she was my mentor and I never knew until today that she and Robert were dear friends. Oh. And um, I, I posted a link to my blog uh, honoring her and honoring the International Day of Peace celebration I'm organizing in El Paso, Texas. Um, and uh, I just feel completely held uh, by this net of goodness. So thank you. Thank you. Um, El Paso needs you. As you know, you've been in the news quite a bit with flooding and immigrants, and it's just a sad place. And God bless you for being there and holding the energy that we are one world. And I so appreciate you. The other day, I wanted to say something about Pakistan. And I was saying, why don't we have a singing tree there? that would unite these people who are in this flood zone. I mean, they have nothing to hold on to. So it's really, a, Jerry, I'm gonna ask you to mute and then I'm gonna to go to Joanne. Joanne Dufour, who I really could not end this meeting with without having Joanne talk. Joanne, um, Joanne, I'm not even gonna say why I love you, but you tell us how you knew Robert. Um, well, you know, Robert was very global. Right. And and he was a strong believer in global education, but he was also very local. And uh, I'm a New Yorker and uh, I was teaching at a school in Dobbs Ferry and Robert lived in Dobbs Ferry. And so every opportunity that I could hear him speak in a local capacity, I would. And he was he was thrilling. So as a teacher, I remember inviting him to our teachers conference. Well, he went to the teacher's conference and they were going to allocate him about 10 minutes. Well, I think Robert took about an hour. <laughs> he just, uh, you know, the schedulers were all upset. He got a standing ovation for 10 minutes from that audience. Uh, and every time I heard him, he would get a standing ovation. Um, eventually, when I did went into teacher training, I asked him if, if he could share some materials. And we did. He did. He All the materials that were relevant to his own education and his own learning, we put together in something called Essays on Education. Well, Essays on Education was one of my textbooks whenever I taught. And uh, But we didn't just stop there because I wanted the students to be able to write to him about what reading his words meant. Well, he was eliciting the most beautiful letters from the students. You know, because honest to goodness, they were writing to the assistant secretary general. I mean, this was a frightening prospect, but it worked. And of course, Robert, being Robert, responded to every single student. They got a personal letter back from him. So this man was not only global, he was local in the most beautiful ways. Joanne, I did not know you taught in Dobbs Ferry. That's sure. where we lived. And yeah. I did not know you because I came into his life in 1994. And I remember seeing your essays on education. And I remember Robert being so in love with you. And I said, well, why didn't you marry Joe? And he said, well, I don't know. <laughs> Married. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was, it was just so wonderful. And I must tell you, he never stopped writing letters. Let me tell you. Our whole relationship it was uh, based on him writing to heads of state, and it really allowed everybody to 
um, see what a man can think about when a world is in, in such dilemmas that we have today, as you know. And so he would just sit back and he would start to write. And he used his little typewriter with his two fingers. He never did teach any, nobody ever taught him how to really type. So his two little fingers. In fact, when I went to Costa Rica with thanks to Douglas Gillies, he took me to Costa Rica so we could meet Robert. He was the, the convener of the second one, A Matter of Life and A Matter of Death. And we went to the University for Peace and, Rob, and Douglas said to, um, please show us how you type. So Robert's typing, dee, 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 and it says, Barbara, I love you. And I said, you love me? You know, I didn't realize that he cared for me, but he typed that on the typewriter. And I still had that little note, that little precious note. And then I started paying attention. And then about in 1995, he sends me this book. But war taught me about peace. And you can see all the numbers of stickies I have in here because he has a peace plan. He has a world. Don't wait for a better world. Do it now. You never know when the time is. All these little stickies. I just would write all these notes. Preamble to the United Nations Charter. This book is like a tomb, a, a tomb, a glossary of the world. So if you ever get a chance, get what war taught me about peace. Anyway, he writes in here. I'm still alive. Oh, dear Barbara, have my heaven. Listen to this. This is how you inscribe a book to people so they'll remember you. To Barbara, my heavenly love. This is one of the last copies of the book. I will, it will tell you more about my life. See the chapter on good teachers. May God bless you with a wonderful life and bless our love. And I could cry right now, but I don't have time. Book was published in 1985. And here in... He always wrote on his books. And in 2006, he said, I'm still alive in August 2006, 21 years later at the age of 83. Reading this book again in November of 2006, what a personal treasure it is for my life. So he would read, but he didn't just read. He underlined. He put his opinions in. He would say, let's change that now. He would put words in and he would always remember that it might have only been up to him to make a difference. And I want to ask you each to just remember that you now are carrying the spirit of Robert. You're carrying some of his words, some of his books, some of his. I can hardly think sometimes because I'm so busy reading all of Robert's books. The idea that Douglas mentioned about the 7,500 ideas and dreams for a better world turned into 12 volumes. On the back of Prophet, you see Ted Turner said, what would I do if I wouldn't have had a mentor like Robert? And then I asked, who was it recently who said, I'm, I'm not going to be able to be on, but I want to tell you what Robert meant to me. And she said it meant he meant that I could be bigger than I thought I could be. How could I do that? And all of a sudden, she said all she had to do was think the thought. She could be bigger than she thought she could be. She could do more than her mind told her she could do. And all of a sudden, she made this incredible effort. And all of a sudden, we have a new de development on the planet. And it was she who wrote those words. Oh, Elizabeth Saturis, evolutionary biologist in Hawaii. You know, it's much earlier there. She said, Robert was the first person to give me the courage to write the book Gaia. Robert was over the moon about my book, Gaia. He got it in the United Nations bookstore, and that was the beginning of my writing career. So you see, you never know when your words are going to mean something to another. You may not be Robert Mueller, but you certainly are alive. And I was walking down the hall the other day, and I said, I'm alive, and I have a whole day. What am I going to do with this whole day? A whole day to do something. Last night, I was talking to Judith Harris. Wave your hand, Judith. This is my dear friend, Judith Harris. She was the president of the United Nations SoCal for years, and she did such a fabulous job. And, and she's just been my mentor for the United Nations. You know, the United Nations Association is spread all over, and we're all in part of the United Nations, the local to the global. And so last night, I was telling her one of the ideas that keeps you from getting Alzheimer's. And I practiced this with Robert. Look, at there she is, Joanne DeFore, drink your water, drink your water, 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 water. You know, they did this research and they did these autopsies on these people who died of Alzheimer's and who died of heart disease, and they were dehydrated. 
dear God in heaven, if you just drink your water, you may not get Alzheimer's and you may live even longer. I was thinking, I got to put this on Facebook and, and it's the truth. And Sandy, Sandy Hinden, Sandy Hinden, I'm going to end with you today. Sandy Hinden and I and Douglas launched profit at the United Nations as another world war was about to begin. Sandy, talk a few minutes about what Robert meant to you and you will be our last speaker today. My dear friend, Sandy, who's working with Helen and Julie and I on mutually assured survival. Thank you, Sandy, for your brilliance and your contributions. Please, Sandy, give us a couple of words about what Robert meant to you. Okay, so there's no couple of words. So I, you know, I, I have trouble speaking because I was different than Robert. Robert was a very fluent speaker, but all my life I could hardly speak because my brain was so active I couldn't get out words like they would like trains. Like a a train has different train cars, and I couldn't speak clearly because I had so many ideas. I couldn't articulate them properly. Well, in, in school, it was a nightmare. But Ro when I met Robert, it was like a phenomenon. You know, I, I understood everything from, the, the, from the, the smallest atom to the cosmic. He explained everything very quickly in a, in a speech. So, but just to summarize, and I'll share more next time when I speak, these are 10 qualities that I saw of Robert, and I'm going to write an article about it because I love to write. One was cosmic vision. The second is global vision. The third is he was brilliant. He was very smart and wise. The fourth is, as, um, as mentioned, he was like a hero to humanity. He was bold and courageous. The fifth is he was creative and innovative. The sixth is he was kind-hearted. The seventh, he was appreciative and enthusiastic. The eighth, he was, he was on top of all of that, he was humble. And he honored others. He honored the people that came into his life and encouraged us to work on things and to do our work. And he was grateful and he was hardworking. He was always hardworking. So those 10 characteristics, I'm gonna embellish them in an article and I'll share the, how, the history when I speak next time of how I met him and, and what occurred in that process. So thanks so much. And when he speak the next time, he is our speaker for chapter seven, because he has an ability, and you can do a PowerPoint if you want, because he is able to put things visually. His brain is like a, um, I don't even know, like an egg beater, and, it, and then he puts it visually, and all of a sudden, it calms it down, and we see his concepts. You will not believe that we would have Mutually Assured Survival website, mutuallyassuredsurvival.world is all because of Sandy, because of his brilliant brain, like the egg beater moving so fast. But if he puts it visually, then it slows it down and we can all enjoy it. This is an amazing man. So next time on um, October, we will be meeting and we will be having Sandy as our speaker. Now, I'm going to go back to gallery view and see if there's any last comments. Is there anybody who did I, I might have accidentally ignored? Because I would like to have Diane finish today. Diane, please. Well, there was one thing I want to say to Sandy. One thing to add to your list is inspiration. He was so inspirational. Every time I saw him speak in public, you could see everyone lighting up. They were all inspired in spirit when he spoke. And to me, that was the thing that I, when I think of him, he was just this amazing spirit. And he woke us up. He woke us up. And the optimism and enthusiasm that he generated was his gift to us. You know, to me, that was one of the things I took is this tremendous optimism. You know, no matter what was going on, optimism and, and just a positive attitude, no matter what, when he was in jail. And so I learned how to apply that in my own life, in every situation, every crisis. You know, so to me, his inspiration was his greatest gift in the United Nation, to all of us individually, to everyone that ever heard him speak or meet him.
So he was a gift to the world. He still is. You know, I sometimes think that, Diane, you just say the words at the right time, exactly what I need to hear, and just putting the word inspire, inspire, and enthusiasm. Do you know enthusiasm means with God? And I felt like he was operating out of another element sometimes. I felt like he was speaking for God, and he inspired. And all of a sudden, these standing ovations were pretty common. And tears were very common in his talks. He would get so wound up in talking about the world that could be, that out of pure joy, he would just have these tears shed. I remember I was in Santa Monica with him one time. And they were celebrating a peace day and they had all these doves in this cage and they were going to let all these doves fly out. And I thought, oh, my goodness. And there was Robert crying and the doves. He said, I don't want to let you go. I love you. And he was crying about having the doves fly off because he wanted them to be there with him. He would, and if you look at Richard Denton's background, you see the dove of peace. Robert was a man of peace. He lived it. He inspired it. And then when he came to Santa Barbara at the Mind and Supermind, and I was in the audience, and they came to me and said, you know, Robert spoke here twice, and each time he got a standing ovation. Nobody else has gotten a standing ovation. What is the difference? Is it because he spoke with his heart? Because he, as his book says, it's all about love? Is it he loved the audience? He loved the words? And he would kind of just get quiet before he went to talk, and the words would be, exactly what the audience needed to hear. And I can tell you many stories of being at the 50th anniversary of the United Nations. And he remembered that when he started at the UN, the young ambassador coming up to him and telling him, what are you doing here, young man? And Robert said, I've come to spend my life working for peace. And he said, I pity you young person because the United Nations is only gonna last five years. And Robert said, well, I hope you're alive because I'll be at the 50th anniversary. And Joni drove us to the 50th anniversary, or Bettina drove us to the 50th anniversary in San Francisco. And we were there. And I remember this lady coming up and saying to Robert, oh, Robert, I can't thank you enough for the inspiration you gave me. I sold my house and moved to Africa. You said, do what your heart desires. I did that. And this is like Brian Berman, who started our talk today. Brian said, I knew I had to sell my art to pay my way to work for one humanity with Nina, to be there for the refugees from the Ukraine. And so when I think about Robert, I think about all the gifts he's given to all of us. To finish the story about the lady who came up to us at the cathedral in San Francisco, she said, I went to Africa because I knew people were maimed from polio and they couldn't get around. And I created these little scooters, very simple scooters. They didn't even have a motor, two wheels and a piece of wood, and they could move again. And then I created a bus that could hold people who had lost some of their abilities. And now I'm rich and I didn't expect to be rich. I just wanted to save people's lives. So you never know where the passion you have for something will lead you. And I can't even begin to tell you what the passion that Robert gave to me has led me to Peace Podcasts, to so many other things. And again, it's your time to talk and share. So I don't want to talk too much, but I want to thank you. Get ready for October. We're going to have Sandy and read chapter seven. And remember two things, drink water. I want you all to have your brains. <laughs> and remember the second thing, it's up to us to change the world and we can do it. Thank you for being here. Love you all. Peacepodcast.org, if you miss any of our words, it's always replayed there. Thank you.